I still wore the school colors, got B's, and was trying to figure out what kind of boy was right for me when I got a fatal dose of Beatlemania. The Fab Four entered the atmosphere at exactly the right wide open moment for Pam Miller of Reseda, California to become a complete and total blithering idiotic Beatlemaniac. <laughs> Paul McCartney personified the perfect man. And once again, the dumbbells at Cleveland High who didn't ask me to dance at Sock Hops faded into oblivion. I'd been searching for some new teen idols anyway. The Beach Boys and Jan and Dean just weren't my teen cup of tea, and Dion had disappeared after getting weird on national TV. Now what happened really was, he became a heroin addict, um, <laughs> and he's, he's still one of my heroes. And, but I couldn't write about it in here, because I didn't see it. This, there's only two things they asked me to take out of the book, and that was one of them, because I did not witness Dion shooting up. So <laughs> I, did, it, I added that. Here, but anyway. I can tell you, though, he was a heroin addict, and he really got weird on national TV. <laughs> there was a rumor going around, Restita, that Bobby Rydell had gone and married the massive titted mousketeer Annette Funicello, and besides, his records were getting lamer and lamer anyway. And Paul Anka had gone right into the middle of the road and stayed there. He's still there. <laughs> February 10th. Hello, diary. Paul, you are gear. Really fab. Say, chum, why are you so marvelous, love? The most blooming idiot on earth is me, because I'm wild over you, chap. <laughs> kind of embarrassing, but I put it all out there anyway. The country of England, which hadn't existed for me until now, became Mecca, and every day I sent Paul a retardedly corny poem written on an airgram and sealed with a kiss. March 2nd. It's 2.21 a.m. at Paul's house. He's sleeping. I'm glad. <laughs> I wish I could see him sleeping. I really do. I wish I could be with him sleeping. Just kidding. <laughs> I hope he read my poem before he closed his beautiful brown eyes. Even though I dreamed about what was between Paul's perfect milky white thighs, I had not yet conjured up dimensions. I collected Beetle bubblegum cards, and one of them was a shot of Paul playing his bass, sitting on a bed in a hotel with his legs apart. You could actually see the shape of his balls being crushed by the tightness of his trousers. <laughs> And I carried that card around with me in a little gold box with cotton covering it like it was a precious jewel. I peeked into it reverently once a day and lifted the cotton gently, holding my breath as I stared between his legs at the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> the truth. I still have that. It's still in the little gold box. I should bring it with me to things like this, you know, because it's really cute. And you can see his fucking ball. day on my Beatles station, KRLA, Dave Hull, the hullabalooer, would announce whether or not Paul was engaged to marry the creepy, freckle-faced Bow Wow, Jane Asher. <laughs> it drove me crazy. It's all I thought about. I stare at his face upon my wall. I know I love him best of all. His gorgeous eyes just knock me down. I swear I think he should wear a crown. The way he moves when he sings a song. Let's hope he doesn't marry before long. March 20th. He's not. He's not. Brian Epstein sent a cablegram to Columbia Records to announce Paul getting married is completely and ridiculously untrue. Brian Epstein, yay! There's no queen for my king yet. <laughs> you know, I met him fairly recently, and yeah, I tr there he was, right in front of me, my, my beetle bubblegum card in the flesh, and he was with that girl, Heather, who yeah, he should never have hooked up with. And now he's married again. I keep missing my chance. <laughs> really a nightmare. <laughs> I lost some good friends who were growing up and going steady and planning their lives after high school. They left me behind with my Beatles lunchbox and bobbing head dolls, practicing my Liverpoolian accent. And guess what? They're probably still in Reseda with a gaggle of goony kids to kowtow to, being forced to listen to Motley Crue by their very own burgeoning teenagers. And it serves them right. <laughs> We gravitated to one another, the Beatles sweeties, and hung around in packs of four, one for each Beatle. Kathy Willis was my George friend. Her dad knew somebody who worked at the Hollywood Bowl and was going to get us good seats for the Beatles concert on August 23rd. I always have had somebody getting me in. Fantastic. <laughs> Even before I knew what it meant. 
We got our tickets before anyone else and bought gilt frames to put them in and hung them on our bedroom walls. I paid homage to my ticket nightly. My entire room was covered with beetle paraphernalia. I wrote with a beetle pen, slept on a beetle pillowcase, and breathed with beetle lungs. Stevie was my Ringo friend, and no one understood the poor thing. <laughs> oh, Pammy, I feel like the world is caving in on me. Everyone's trying to take me Ringo away from me. Help me, Pam. Oh, please, please help me. I need encouragement so bad. I've got to meet Ringo or my whole life will be completely empty. <laughs> oh, I'm suffering so. He's my love, and I love him. Oh, God, please don't let me Ringo be taken away. <laughs> We wrote beetle letters to each other constantly, whining and moaning and expressing our deep, deep, deep desire to meet the beetle of our choice. But how, how, how? Linda was my John friend. We spent weekends at my Aunt Edna's house so we could be on neutral ground, pretending it was hallowed beetle ground. We were two girls in a constant state of beetle skit. I played John and myself, and she played Paul and herself. We could switch personalities with the flick of an accent. We took each other to parties and concerts, we ate dinner in gorgeous restaurants on Aunt Edna's patio, and professed undying love with semi-perfect working-class Liverpoolian accents. At night, we played all four people at the same time, when we would lie entwined in each other's arms, pressing our four sets of lips together in an eternal expression of beetle love. <laughs> <laughs> we wrote Beatles stories for each other, and I could hardly wait to get to school to get my hands on the next installment of my continuing Paul saga. I had six stories going on at once, but my favorite was written by my old friend Iva. It was so titillating, she actually got us in the sack. <laughs> we never wound up doing anything. I didn't know, I couldn't even figure it out at that, what was actually went on. I know you guys, you know, it happened much earlier. As, you know, as life went on, but I was still pretty innocent at 14, 15 to 16. Okay. My dad bought me a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and I made up a lot of adorable little plays, acting out all the different parts in which Jane Asher dies many grisly, horrifying <laughs> deaths. <laughs> it's true. I pushed her off cliffs. I mean, uh, the things I did to this poor girl. The Pam Miller character was always around to pick up Paul's pieces. To his nibs, I sang a different tune. Dear Paul, your friends will always love you. Personally, I will never stop. And I have not. Since hearing about your engagement to Jane Asher, I'll have to love you in another way, all of my own. Paul McCartney of Beatle fame has chosen another to share his name. Many girls will cry each night, saying, This marriage just cannot be right. Even though all his fans are blue, it's to her he whispers, I love you. His face is like an angel, so they say, and it's hers to gaze upon night and day. He is hers to have and hold till their lives are ending, till they both grow old. Sure, there are people who will say he's wrong, but let's just hope his love is strong. If he listens to us, where will he be? He'll be without children to bounce on his knee. He'll miss out on the purpose of life, to live, to love, have a child and a wife, or several. <laughs> if we really loved him, how happy we'd be that he's found such happiness and ecstasy. She is his chosen flame to share with him the McCartney name. <laughs> yeah. I really wish that was me. I really do wish I was with Paul McCartney right now. <laughs> as much as I'm happy to be here with you guys, <clears throat> it's enough to make you throw up. I just want his autograph. Just his autograph? That's all I want. I'm happy with that. I developed a series of rituals that I had to perform every night or I would never meet Paul. Number one, write I love Paul at the top of my diary in my most perfect handwriting. I still have all those pages. They should be in the Smithsonian. <laughs> Listen to a Beatles record before sleep. No other sound could assault my eardrums after the sacred sound. If the dog barked, I had to climb out of bed and start over. Right at that point, it was, and I love her. Because in the movie, when Paul sang it, in The Hard Day's Night, when he opened his mouth and there was this little thing of spittle coming down. Okay. And I just, I just, I just, I just wanted it, you know? Okay. Number three, put a sweet tart under my tongue as my head hit the pillow and let it dissolve as I pictured myself in his arms. In 
addition to these rituals, I had to write his name down every time I farted. <laughs> It's so embarrassing. <laughs> and I carried the list around with me until it reached well into the thousands before I became embarrassed and hid it underneath the clothes hamper. <laughs> so that's part of my Beatles story.